everybody. Um, my name is Crystal Clark and um, Diane Rolson and myself will be hosting today. Um, welcome elders, guests, um, participants from across the province. Um, I know we had about 77 registered. Um, so welcome everybody from wherever you are this afternoon. Um, my name is Crystal. I am Nehewayao Dene Métis, originally from Treaty 8. I now reside in Treaty 6 territory where I began working this year as an Indigenous Education Specialist with Wild Rose School mm -hmm. Division. I've been working with CAS as a consultant since about 2019. And I'm very happy to be a part of this virtual circle today um, with our respected guests, Doreen Burgum, Mary Colin Cardinal, Janine Bell, and Sokokuto Randy Bottle. So before we delve into the virtual um, elders and knowledge keepers sharing circle, um, we will be um, doing a welcoming um, prayer um, if you have um, your own smudge, wherever you might be, um, you're welcome to join in um, with us in that as well. Um, we'll be giving an overview of the digital resource guide, and then we'll be inviting our circle of elders to um, share with us um, their knowledge on guiding us in relationships and learning um, with one another across um, Alberta. And um, so, yeah, before we start, um, we or delve into the virtual circle, we are going to start in a good way. And I'd like to uh, thank Elder Sokokuto um, for uh, leading us in a um, opening blessing, as well as Janine and Doreen, um, who will also follow. So I'm just going to unshare my screen at this moment so we can um, do that. If any time you can't see my screen. OK, stop share. All right. So thank you, um, Elder uh, Sokoto. <laughs> Starting us off in a good way. Okay. <clears throat> you know, before I begin um, with the Amadou Sima, is how we would say uh, to smudge in black, but <clears throat> this is all part of relationship building is to bring us together in ceremony, in conversations. Um, and, and this is how we start off in a good way. We ask the creator to bless our circle. And for all of us to get something from everyone that's going to share and as a way of how we acknowledge and humble ourselves to the, uh, to the creator and how I would begin every day. There's four things that I always ask for. I always ask for guidance, strength, wisdom, and, and, and patience to face my challenges. We all face challenges. And this is how we would begin. And ask blessings to make it through the day. That is how I would prepare myself. And by going through this way of balancing your, your inner spirit is starting off in a good way. And to share all the information as to how it was shared with me by my elders many years ago. And I would ask all of you to, to acknowledge the creator in your own way and how you're going to participate to strengthen our circle. And I will pray in my language, Blackfoot language, and I'm gonna smudge with the sweet grass. And I have a call in my smudge box. <clears throat> Let's make our circle strong and let's pray together. Ayo na pinatosi. Ayo tsakamito piaki na a. Ayo kinukatsin kitsmata kinuka kusisi koika. Ayo spoken is kind of thomas das of tani pakinika katsmuskani. O kinuka kinuka paka must walk at kinuka kusisi koika. O kinuka to tap a spinak needs the beaters to mask the kilpi. Hanikat <laughs> 
ولی که اتنا خطاب داشت کنش داشت چه باید تپیو پاکی گای که اتنا خطاب ماکی پاکی 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 پا Nak kita kau suka pika, kita kau terpisah nak. Ane kau nak kau ikat kita tu makin kita skrima susah sini kau. Oh kita kau kira itu pihok kau. Ane kau tak kaya kau kau tak sih kita ni kau kena suka pika. Iki naik kita kau sini kau. Asli nak tu sih kita kau kau mesti. Oh kita kau kau suka pika kau kita kau ikat. Oh kita kau tak sih kau sepana tak tak suka pika kau tak kau kaya kau tak sih sepana. Oh, kena kita nak nista apa kena nista supaya terpilih pat, mau pun kita untuk kena pat nak pilih sini kan kita hutan, ah supaya terpilih sini, mau kita sini supaya terpilih sini. Amasicho, thank you, Sukokato, and we'll invite Janine to. Start us off in a good way, um, and she'll explain what she's uh, going to do for us in this virtual circle as well. Thank you for for um, sharing this space and inviting me. And in. um, I'm really uh, I'm really honored and humbled uh, to be here to share um, you know a little bit of, of what I've come to know. And I'm trying to make sure that my Khalik. Um, so this is a Khalik. Uh, and um, when I when I when I left my my home village um, in in the north, uh, and and you know I, I've spent a considerable amount of time uh, across uh, what we now call Canada and many different Indigenous communities, um, at, uh, specifically First Nations communities. And uh, one of the one of the things that I've noticed is that you know smudge was always there, and I was like, oh well, you know, I don't Inuit smudge. And so one of the things that I really had to reflect on is you know how our Sarah ceremonies and our protocol and you know how how our ways of, of doing things um are, are different or similar or you know what what kinds of things we share and you know I quickly came to learn that you know it's um you, we, we have different medicines and you know above the tree line in the arctic we don't have we don't have trees um and uh, a lot of the things that grow um because of the permafrost um you know in in the tundra um you know things grow short so um we don't have you know uh sage we don't have trees we don't have you know many things um so we have to be resourceful and we use what we do have and considering um, you know, that we do have uh, Arctic cotton um, and we have oil from seal and we have stone. Um, we we make our lamps from that. So uh, we can't have, you know, fires where we burn uh, wood and, and, and whatnot because we don't have wood to burn. So we do use our cotton and our oil and our stone lamp uh, as our home fire. And it's, it's particularly important considering the Arctic climate. Um, as we all uh, may be well aware that, um, you know, in, in Inuit Nunaga, in our Inuit homelands, uh, the temperatures in the winter can be very cold and even our springs and summers would be considered cold by some in the south. Um, so the khulik is our is our stone lamp um, and it's used as it's it's, a, it's our home fire. Uh, it's our source of light. Um, it's our source of heat and it's the only way that we have to cook food when when we do cook food. Um, and so it's, it's a significant um, you know tool and very symbolic in that you know, it lights our way, it keeps us warm, um, you know, and it's it's something that when we when we gather together, the women would would take uh, care of it to keep um, to, you know, to light our way to pro provide us with those sources of light and those um, yeah, and, and, and again, to, to stay warm. And so, um, you know, less functional today, uh, once upon a time, uh, you know, in our, uh, in our igloo or in our tukpik, um, this would be uh, essential uh, to keep us warm. And again, for that light through the 24 hour darkness in the winter time. Um, and, uh, and now it's, it's more of a symbol um, of, again, that, of that gathering around fire, the home fire, the warmth, um, and the light that, that we all bring in, that we all share when we come into relationships relationship and we come into shared spaces um, to, you know, to, to build our relationships, to establish and maintain them and uh, and to light our, our home fires in different ways. So I, I light the khulik and I will, um, I'll keep that lit or I'll do my best to keep it lit as we go through um, and visit with each other today. Thank you. 
Nanaskmatan Masicho. Thank you, Janine. Um, I, I can't see that. I just see your hand lighting it. I, I don't know if you want our participants to uh, see what you're holding. If you can. Up, there we go. There we go. Yes. A little low. Yeah. Masicho. Would you like me to invite Doreen now, um, Janine? Yeah, all right. So Doreen, if you'd like to also uh, start us off in our circle in a good way, we'd be very appreciative. Absolutely. Thank you, Doreen. Doreen Bergen, de Ambrose, de Métis la femelle Dufresne Vaness. I was born and raised and still lived in Treaty 7 uh, and a proud member of Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. God, our Creator, we pray that we may be truly grateful for the many blessings we enjoy this day. We ask for your blessing on this gathering. We gather today to seek your guidance, wisdom, courage, and strength, to understand each other, to respect each other, to work with each other. Bless all those who have gathered here. Keep their families safe and healthy. Keep our children of the right path so they grow up tall and strong. Bless our elders, and give them long lives, for we need their wisdom. Bless all who are sick in our community. Bring them comfort and healing. We ask your blessing that we come together to make a difference at this meeting. Merci and de toi Good evening, Beautiful. Thank you um, so much, Doreen. Masi Cho and Naskmatin, um, much appreciating, appreciative to all three of you for starting us off in a beautiful way. And I will um, send Mary, uh, Mary uh, Colin Cardinal's um, regrets. She will join us um, via speaker a little bit later on, um, but she too um, is offering her welcome to, to all of us here today. So um, I'm just going to share the land acknowledgement slide um, and I'll um, hand the virtual talking stick or rock over to um, Diane. And I'm just going to share that slide. <clears throat> so bear with me, entire screen. Webinar, view, slideshow. Oh, uh. There we go. Do you see the land acknowledgement slide? Yes. 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 Thank you, Diane. Uh, so, Oki, Adlanate, Dada Nastara, Ambawastich, Unu Sekut, Sego, Hoa, Anin, Tanchi, Bonjour, and Good Afternoon. Um, I'm so pleased to be co-hosting the webinar with Crystal and to be able to acknowledge the land this afternoon. And I too would like to thank Sagogto and Janine and Darlene, uh, Doreen for your beautiful uh, opening words and blessings. I was born in Mukinsis, the Blackfoot word for elbow, the place where the Bow and the Elbow Rivers meet, also known as Calgary, and that is where I am today. I am a white settler with Icelandic and French roots and a guest in this place. And I'm currently working as a leadership consultant with CAS. I am so fortunate to have learned from many elders and knowledge keepers over time, in particular during the many years I worked for the Calgary Board of Education. And I learned from them how important it is to acknowledge the land where we gather 
and the first peoples who traditionally lived here. They taught us that doing so shows respect for people, their contributions, and their ways of knowing, which are reflected through the stories and songs that have lived on this land for thousands and thousands of years. I carry these teachings with me every day. Um, my friend Iki Nayuka, Marlene Yellowhorn from Ghana First Nation and currently a PhD student at the University of Calgary, shared a teaching from her grandfather who said that the land acknowledgement is not something you do, it's something you feel. Some of what I am learning to feel and get more in touch with is how greatly I have benefited from land that was taken from Indigenous peoples. Dr. Verna St. Denis, an anti-racist scholar and someone whose work and writing has taught me so much, has said that we must acknowledge and face this truth, the truth of land being cleared so some of us could live a good life. I'm committed to learning more about this truth and the great benefit I continue to enjoy in this place I call home and what that means for my responsibilities. So this includes my commitment to work each day to build my literacy in anti-racism. My friend Lori Pritchard, Métis and Ukrainian from Saskatchewan, and currently the education director with the Calgary Board of Education has taught me that when we acknowledge the land, we must connect that acknowledgement to action, which is why I've shared one of my commitments to action with you today. So as we begin, I would like to acknowledge the Blackfoot Confederacy, which includes the Siksika, the Bigani and the Ghana nations, the Stony Nakoda First Nations of the Chiniki, the Bearspaw and the Good Stony Nations, the Sutina Nation, the traditional homeland of the Metis Nation, Region 3, and as the elders taught me to include all people who make their home in the Treaty 7 region of Southern Alberta. And I acknowledge as well all of the places from which each of you is joining today. Uh, Hi, thank you so much, uh, Diane, for that uh, beautiful, heartfelt land acknowledgement. Um, it really did touch me emotionally as well, and I really uh, appreciate your, your kind words. Um, so before we get into, um, the circle once again I am hoping that we can all um, imagine that we are not sitting in front of our little square screens um, and we're going to try to visualize a beautiful place um, that brings us joy comfort that connects us to the land in a good way and we're going to imagine that we are in circle together enjoying this moment um, connected to nature. Now, sometimes, most often, you know, we may not be able to um, be outside, but we can, um, through our imagination, imaginings and heart, uh, imagine these places that we are, are and how those feelings that uh, connecting to the land bring us um, can carry us um, through, through our days. So the visual, um, the guide, that we're going to talk about in a bit. It's a visual flow um, does center around um, the graphic of a tree um, and the leaves of a tree. And the birch tree was chosen as the concept for this guide um, that we'll talk about shortly to remind us of our deeply rooted connection to the natural world. We are all re related, uh, Wakotawin in Cree. The trees are our relatives, the water, the air. Um, we all rely on one another and we all um, connect. Um, so 
we're going to take this moment and I'm not going to play the entire soundscape, um, but maybe for a, a moment, um, we can imagine we're in this beautiful outdoor space together. So if you're comfortable closing your eyes, um, you can do that for a moment. And while we're listening and visualizing a place of peace um, on the land together, um, try to remember to breathe. Um, and breathe deeply and connect uh, to your hearts. So we'll start this um, guided um, visualization um, together right now. All right, so thank you for um, taking a short moment to imagine that we are outside together in a beautiful place connected to the land. Um, and I apologize if the trickling water um, made you feel like you have to use the washroom. <laughs> um, but I started focusing on the birds, um, the sound of the birds, the sound of spring. And for me, that brings me much joy. So um, I hope that that moment, that minute um, brought you some uh, level of joy as well. Um, so I briefly, for those um, participants who may not be familiar with the digital resource guide that uh, CAS um, put together in 2019, if you're not familiar with that, I'm going to briefly um, show you that guide and how to access it and what the intention is of this digital resource guide and what it has to do with um, building, maintaining, and fostering relationship with First Nation, Métis, and Inuit people. Um, and then from there, we will um, begin with our elders circle. So the image that you see on um, the circle, the leaves, um, the center is relationship. Um, so within the guide, we, we encourage um, users of the guide to start with the relationship section. And before I click on the link, I just want to explain why the birch tree was chosen as the graphic um, for, for uh, people who use the guide to interact with. And for one reason, which we just experienced is so that um, we're constantly reminding um, educators that uh, we are connected to the land and the land is also uh, a place where we can, we learn and we value um, deeply. So the birch tree, um, like many other trees throughout this land, um, we use for ceremony, medicine, shelter, food, transportation, art, tools, cooking, construction, and our survival. The birch tree's legacy represents our connection to land, life, spirituality, traditional engineering, science, art, culture, and our education. Trees connect all of us to each other through our breath. Um, we share breath, even though we may not um, think of it that way, we're all sharing breath and we give thanks to the trees for, for, for providing um, this clean air that we, we breathe on a daily basis. The symbol of the tree reminds us that although we might often be stuck behind our computers or in our square pace spaces, it's important to acknowledge and connect with the land and each other um, every day. So, um, did I miss anything? Okay. So 
So I'm going to click on this link and it should open to a page. <clears throat> All right, so if you're unfamiliar how to get to the digital resource, um, the Guide to Relationship and Learning with Indigenous Peoples of Alberta, every time I want to find it, all I do is I, in the Google search or whatever search engine you use, I type CAS Indigenous and it'll, it'll be the first, it usually is the first or second um, thing that will, will come up in your search, CAS Indigenous, and you'll be taken to this page. So um, this beginning page um, gives a little bit of an overview of why CAS um, initiated this digital resource. So the digital resource um, in itself is a, as a starting point um, for some um, educators, leaders, um, superintendents. Um, it's a starting point to begin to um, delve into foundational knowledge um, of First Nation, Métis, Inuit. It's not an all-inclusive um, guide to building relationships. It's merely one, almost like a small leaf on a tree. Um, it's one part of something bigger. The re relationship and the building of relationship with the actual people is, um, is um, what we need to do to foster, maintain, um, and support relationships. This guide is simply just one other small portion um, to help superintendents um, in their journey towards relationships with um, First Nation, Métis, and Inuit people. So this is what the first page um, will look like. And um, the late Sykes Powderface um, gives a beautiful introduction to um, the guide. Um, and I hope that if you haven't um, seen the digital guide yet, that you'll take time to um, see some of the videos included in it um, as well. So I'm going to click on this icon right here. So once you click that, you will get to a larger um, version of that graphic. I have to scroll up for some reason. And so <clears throat> the guide was developed to support members as system leaders to begin the process of deepening their understanding of foundational knowledge. The guide is like a branch of leaf. It is a small part of the bigger picture or the whole tree and only a small piece of the forest. The leaf connects to the branches, seeds, bark, trunk, roots, and all that nurture and sustains and connects to us. It's used to help activate or support the building of foundational knowledge. The intent of the site is only a small piece of relationship building. It can support for those beginning their learning journey and entering into relationships with First Nation, Métis, and Inuit in their local communities. And it can also support those who've already um, began building those relationships or are working to repair relationships. And the guide was first launched in 2019 and a lot has changed since then. There was a relaunch um, last year. And so when the guide first um, was launched, uh, there was some resources that we could point people in the direction to. But since 2019, there's a hundred um, of more valuable resources. Um, and so we tried to include some of those as well. And I'll show you how to get there in a moment. Um, but even today, um, there's even more resources that could be added um, to direct educational leaders too. And so in a sense, the guide is like a living document as well, um, where it will be repopulated and updated um, as well as time moves forward. So the guide always emphasizes that the guide, the digital guide isn't the work, but rather connecting with First Nations, Métis and Inuit is the work. And the guide is just a small piece of that. So there was a collaborative effort in creating this guide and I'll just quickly uh, acknowledge um, this. So we had an, an ATA Indigenous Elders Advisory um, in 2019 and all, um, for example, Doreen, um, you are featured in some of the videos on this guide. Um, so all those involved in the Indigenous Education Advisory at that time were involved in introducing LEAFs to this guide. Um, and many people um, had input to portions of the guide as well. For example, Billy Jill Grant, um, when she was working with Rupert's Institute, she um, contributed a large portion to the Métis section as well as Aileen Martin Martinson also contributed a lot 
um, to the uh, her and the perspectives as well. Um, superintendents and educators also gave input and reviewed the guide and had opportunity to input and um, into the guide as well. So I'll just quickly show you one leaf. Um, so for those people who haven't seen this guide um, before, so you can know how to navigate it. So I always like to suggest starting with relationship um, at the center, because that's at the heart of the work that we're doing. And each leaf sort of covers a foundational knowledge topic. For example, identity, teaching, language, learning from the land, treaties and agreements, laws and policies, reconciliation and then acknowledgements. And as I mentioned, if this is a living document, then new leaves might be added. For example, when it was re rewritten in 2021 with much more content, um, we, talk, we, add, we included um, some emphasis on anti-racist education as well as decolonizing education. But at this point, um, I feel that perhaps there needs to be um, new leaves added to this resource to really um, include um, more in-depth knowledge about what decolonizing education um, can and should look like, as well as anti-racist education. So that could, um, this will change again um, in the future, I'm imagining. So each leaf um, starts with a video. Um, we have the le lovely uh, Guta Desmarais introduce, introducing relationships and re relationality. So within this section and all sections, it'll give a brief um, kind of background of the topic, what is relationship and relationality? How does this relate to um, the quality standards? as well. Um, and then you'll always see at the bottom a reflection piece. So if you're going to use this resource within your school community, um, can you and a group of leaders or educators um, delve into certain related resources and then come together and reflect on um, what you've learned and what you think you can do to move relationship forward. So at the bottom, there's various resources you can access. So this current version has a lot of input um, from Rupert's Lens Education. The first version um, didn't have enough, um, but as more content is added, or wait, maybe it's the next one, where's Rupert's Lens? So, um, oh, here it is. So you can click on these links and it'll take you to other institutions or people who are doing great work. Um, within education um, across Indigenous, First Nation, Métis, Inuit, Indigenous education across the province. Um, again, to help um, educators build their foundational knowledge. So um, each leaf looks the same way, um, has the video. Oh, I have to scroll back up. So if I click on the teachings link and the titles of the leafs could change. So we have the late, uh, lovely um, Irene uh, Ludit. Um, uh, sorry, um, introducing this section. And um, we have a lot of, we worked with a lot of wonderful people and we will continue um, working with a lot of wonderful elders and knowledge keepers to help to continue support um, our superintendents and leaders um, into the future. So with that, um, I am going to go back to this slide. So that's a brief glimpse into the guide. Um, and now we will, we're going to turn it over um, in a moment as we introduce um, our virtual circle of elders and knowledge keepers. Um, we will shortly um, turn it over to them and I will shut my screen off. Um, I'm going to just give a little bio um, on myself and Diane. We'll give a bio on um, our guests today. All right, so Doreen Burgum, um, you met earlier um, when she gave us a beautiful prayer. Métis elder, knowledge keeper. Her Métis family names include Boudreau, Dumont, Dufernese, and Vanniers. I hope I said those right. She's received the Woman of Excellence Award in 2019, a Certificate of Recognition for Community Involvement in Central Alberta. A SQUEO Award in 2019, a Lifetime Achievement Award for Community Involvement as an Indigenous wo woman, and um, recently received the Queen Elizabeth 11, Queen Elizabeth 11's Platinum Jubilee Medal. 
Um, she has or is continuing to be on many elders advisories, including the UFC, the ATA Elders Advisory Circle, Calgary Catholic School Board, um, Central Alberta Regional Consortium, um, also connected with her to help support teachers um, in Red Deer last year, St. Mary's University um, for Indigenous Reconciliation, Rupert's Land Education, Elders, and the Métis Nation of Alberta. So we're very fortunate that Doreen had time to spend with us today, um, and we're very grateful for you for being here, um, Doreen. And as I mentioned, Mar Mary Cardinal Collins, um, she will join us um, over speaker um, in a bit from Saddle Lake First Nations Treaty 6, um, fluent Cree speaker and translator, Nahiwia, um, a Blue Quills residential school survivor and thriver who worked has worked in the field of Indigenous languages and Indigenous education for over 30 years. Um, she is an experienced Cree language curriculum developer at the provincial and national level. Mary was involved at writing and publishing Aboriginal studies in Alberta Ed um, within Alberta Education. And she also sits on many advisory boards and is a leader in revitalizing the Hiyue Cree language and advocating for Indigenous content inclusion in all curriculum. And uh, I believe Diane will introduce um, Sokokuto and Janine's bios, and then we will move into our circle. Yes. So very honored to introduce Sogokuto, um, who is recognized and honored as a Blackfoot elder and originates from the Blood Tribe, uh, Ghana First Nation, and from the Tall People Clan. Uh, Sogokuto served the Blood Tribe Band Council for 24 consecutive years. And since that time, he's become deeply involved in the Calgary community and beyond supporting the work of many school districts and organizations. He is a gifted teacher and known and loved as Sagogoto to hundreds of young people in schools. He shared his teachings and knowledge at Asanapi, writing on stone for many years. He's the author of several graphic novels published by the Urban Society for Aboriginal Youth. And he is a fluent Blackfoot speaker and deeply committed to sharing the strength of Indigenous knowledges, ways, and people. And we're so delighted that you're here today. Uh, Janine Bell is an Inuk educator, artist, Unga Koyak, community leader of mixed Inuit and English ancestry. She was raised in a semi-remote subarctic village of 450 on the land, water, and ice, practicing the traditional community-centered land-based ways of her Ninatsi Avumiut ancestors. For the past 16 years, Janine has been an honored and humbled guest in the Treaty 6 and Treaty 7 territories, the traditional homelands of her Southern relatives, the diverse First Nations and Métis peoples. She considers it a great privilege to live among her human and more than human relatives, and she is thereby committed to fulfilling her relational obligations to respect and care for the peoples, skies, lands, and waters that sustain and support all life. Great. So I'm going to stop sharing um, the screen. Oops. And stop share. All right. All right. So I believe um, Doreen, Mary, Sokokoto, Janine will be um, sharing with us their knowledge um, and teachings about the importance of relationship and how respectful and reciprocal relationships are created and nurtured within school districts and organizations. As well, they might provide some examples of how school districts and organizations have established and maintained and honored their relationship with them, as well as they may give us insights on how to begin and maintain relationships. Um, and they may give us suggestions on how school districts can care for and honor the knowledge of our elders and knowledge keepers. Um, so take it away, Doreen. <laughs> <laughs> Merci and welcome everyone. Um, I really don't know where to start. I've got so much information and uh, but I'm going to start with um, 
how I was raised. Uh, my parents, Mary and Ambrose Dumont, taught us this seven sacred teachings of love, respect, humility, courage, wisdom, honesty, and truth. Um, a lot of these uh, teachings were done with stories or um, even in um, commitments of us uh, telling a story or stretching a story or uh, in any of the actions that we did and they would turn it around with, uh, with a teaching and uh, a little willow stick if we did the wrong thing. <laughs> and it was always my mother that uh, reprimanded us, not my father. He would just have to open his mouth and uh, we knew we were in trouble. So um, my mother went to, uh, to day school at a residential school in Onion Lake, Saskatchewan. And uh, she never did, never ever spoke of her school, school years. And with that, uh, I reflect now on, um, on her teachings and guidance of uh, how she raised us. And uh, for one thing, she would uh, scrub her floors with bleach on her hands and knees so we wouldn't be called dirty Indians. It was uh, things like this. She was very strict, strict with us. And uh, she made sure we were also scrubbed and cleaned and presented ourselves well. With, uh, <clears throat> with this was uh, coming of respect for ourselves and to go out in this world and be proud of who we are as Métis people. And um, with all her teachings of our, our culture and, um, and these sacred teachings, we have come a long way. I'm from a family of 10, uh, five boys and five girls. And um, I tell the youth when I teach about our culture, we're all born with a gift. And not one of us has the same gift. But uh, my, my gift was in my feet. My mother was a champion jigger. And um, we always had to celebrate or celebrate our culture or do our culture with uh, uh, heavy blankets over our windows. And uh, I've got to tell you, this was in the, the 50s and the 60s. So no one could uh, judge us on our what we are doing with our culture. So uh, to this day, I teach uh, jigging and uh, capote making, moccasin making and beading and also our culture. But uh, with uh, where I'm going with this gift, um, not one of us was born with the same gift. Uh, we have artists, we have singers, we have uh, engineers, we have uh, uh, designers, we, we have everything in our family of 10. And um, I could not, uh, I could not uh, practice my dance until I was uh, 55 years old. And I too became a champion jigger like my mother. But uh, I tell the youth, you know, to find their gift and uh, practice it and share it. Even last night at the graduation for the students, um, I told them to be who they are and uh, pick a career to uh, love what you do and do what you love to carry on and to always, um, I left, with, left them with my mother's words. You are good enough and don't let anyone ever tell you any different. So uh, racism goes a long ways. Uh, a lot of us um, probably hear it every day. In fact, yesterday I went to vote and um, the gal says, um, are you a Canadian citizen? 
And she looked at me as if to say, I wasn't. And I said, yes, I am Métis and a Canadian citizen. And it was, she just, she didn't believe me, actually. And I, I had to show my driver's license. And I was just ready to say, do you want to see my Métis card? So it was questionable. And I thought, oh, it's still, it's still going on. Every day, there's some little thing where we're criticized and judged about who we are and being accepted into, into uh, our Canada. Um, in fact, um, I was uh, an elder on the newcomers uh, organization. And, uh, and I'm also at the Alex, at the, the, uh, the health center. And our government, I don't know where it comes from, they teach our newcomers how to treat uh, First Nations and Métis people. Uh, I was uh, at a meeting at the Alex with the elders, and one of the gentlemen said um, he was he went to check in at the hotel, and um, this gal at the hotel was um, teaching a new person at the reception, and he walked up and. This gal proceeded to tell, teach this girl how to treat this gentleman. And it, of course it was racist. And I thought, how do we change this? How do we change the government on how to treat us? You know, the newcomers are treated better than our own people, our First Nations and Métis and Inuit people. How do we change it? And, uh, but I, I believe how we change it is teaching who we are. You keep teaching and teaching every day. You could teach so many people. And I'll give you an example as, uh, as uh, I was teaching at the uh, Red Deer College and it was to the superintendents and teachers of, um, I believe, the Chinook Edge School. They had seven teepees set up, and uh, Gouda had uh, her ute, I believe you call them, I'm not too sure. And I had a trapper's tent. And uh, we gave, I think, four one-hour classes a day. And there was 10 people that could fit into, um, into my trapper's tent. And we were between classes, and I was uh, inviting everybody in to get ready to start start the next class. And um, the one teacher said, I'm so excited. I'm just so excited. I want to learn about the ditch people. And it set me back. And I said, what are you teaching those kids? I said, get in here. I'm going to tell you about the ditch people. I said, I am a, a road allowance survivor and we're not called ditch people. I was very insulted. So uh, I went going to my road allowance story. Uh, um, my parents, after losing their, um, actually they got married uh, May 3rd, 1937 at St. Paul de Métis. And they always teased each other about uh, getting married behind the church. And in their Cree language, they would uh, tease each other and talk about it, but would never tell us. So I got involved with Circles of Reconciliation at St. Paul de Métis. And um, there's one, sure enough, um, this Métis woman stood up and she said, uh, the Métis and the French built that cathedral or church in St. Paul. But when it was finished, only the French could go inside. And the Métis had to go behind, behind the church. And so they really did get married behind the church. And I think in a small chapel. But uh, they continued to go to church there. And 
From there, my parents moved down to Sundry in 1943 and uh, started a life there because there was uh, jobs there. There was uh, logging and uh, ranching and farming. They could all find jobs to support their families. And we did live on the road allowance. And it was the land between the ditch and the river. And uh, um, I don't know, and I still, I still have to check this out, what the squatter's rights are, or, um, or if you've been on that land so many years and then it becomes your land. But uh, it was probably a month or two weeks before uh, that time period came up. And uh, one of the townspeople didn't like us living there. Um, and he tried to burn our house down. So from there, my dad bought a, um, a schoolhouse, an old one-room schoolhouse. And um, we don't know what was in his mind. Uh, was he going to say, my kids are going to get educated? What was he thinking? Um, but even in the schoolhouse, there was... Uh, um, he bought an acre of land and moved that schoolhouse on there. And there were the blackbirds were even on, on the wall and the, uh, the old um, Canada map with uh, the chocolate bars on the corner. I still remember all this. And he, he gutted that uh, schoolhouse and made a home for us. And uh, so I'm sure he was thinking, my kids are going to go to school. And my mother was very adamant uh, no one was taking her children and um, in 1943 there was um, three of the children they had four children at the time and uh, three of the children were school age and she sent them to school but the teacher would not teach them she uh, set them at the back of the class with coloring books and then uh, they also could not ride the school bus because we we're living on this road allowance and I guess we didn't pay taxes. And, but it didn't take my mom long to straighten out the teacher and uh, was, was teaching. They were teaching her children. But uh, the fights uh, my parents had and the uh, um, moving forward with just trying to survive and uh, raise their children. Um, they've, there's a lot of stories on the way about racism and about uh, um, what we should accept and what we shouldn't. <laughs> but very spiritual, and that's what got us through our spirituality. Uh, they, were, they were raised Roman Catholic, and um, uh, to this day, uh, out of the 10 of all the families, I'm the only one still left uh, going to church. But uh, my spirituality uh, stopped when I heard about the, uh, the children in Kamloops, because I always teach, you know, you can set laws against us. We can't practice our culture. We can't uh, speak our language. And, um, but you'll never take my faith. Well, it was gone, and I didn't know what to do. That was in May, and um, so finally I was uh, dealing with this. I stopped going to church. So um, in at the end of September, I thought, well, I've got to do something about this. At the University of Calgary, um, Michael Hart always had a gathering to check up on the elders. And at this one meeting, I said, you know, I'm really having trouble dealing with my spirituality and where I'm at to this day after this happening. And he's uh, one of the elders spoke up and said, Doreen, uh, take some tobacco and put it under a tree and uh, I will do ceremony for you. I said, OK, and then I'll go talk to the priest. So uh, we did all that, and then I um, 
made my appointment with the priest and walked into church. And the first reaction I got was uh, I was met with uh, one of the CWL women. And uh, she said, well, it's about time you came here. Um, we've got all these uh, teddy bears and shoes outside the church and they're getting dirty and foxes and animals are running off with some of them. And uh, some of our parishioners want to throw them in the garbage. So I, uh, I came unglued <laughs> and I said, you are not throwing those in the garbage. I said, see that wall over there? They're going to bring all those items in. And that's going to be a reconciliation wall. Because reconciliation is not going to happen overnight. In fact, maybe not even my lifetime. So I said, you're going to clean those up, bring them in, and display them. And uh, that's going to be your reconciliation wall. And so they did. They put them in a nice bookshelf and walked into church next time. and. Uh, they had them sitting in the middle of the foyer and said, every child matters. So that was a start. And then they had me come in and tell my story of, and, uh, and uh, teach, teach them our uh, Métis culture. So uh, that's where it started. And that was at church on Sunday. And now the bookcase has disappeared. I don't know where it went. So I'm thinking, is that the end of our reconciliation? What's going to happen from here? I would like to see, I will have to go back to the church <laughs> and tell them. Um, we can make this an annual thing. It doesn't have to be just on September 30th, Reconciliation Day. You can make this a year-round uh, display and support because uh, during the year, throughout the year, and especially after COVID, children still need shoes. All children still need shoes. All children still need teddy bears. Can we not make this a year round support for families? So that's my next step. <laughs> but uh, I don't know how much time I have. But um, we do have a book on all our Métis legacy and all our ceremonies and teachings. It's called um, Our Legacy, Métis Legacy. And it's avail available through the Gabriel Dumont Institute. And it includes First Nations tea dances and smudging and that part of our culture. Actually, there's not too much in there about our French culture. We've gone to First Nations more than anything. Um, and then what's happening this, in this day and age, the true Canadians, forgotten no, no more. Uh, with our new governance, our self-government coming in, we hope to be ready by September, where um, the Métis Nation of Alberta will be um, governing uh, its own its own people. We will be looking after our education, our health, and all our funding that we get from the government in, in our own way. And we will be called the Métis Otem Otepemsewek government. Otepemsewek means the people who own, own themselves. So uh, working with schools and um, educators, I suggest the main thing is get to know us. Get to know us, and go know who we are and what we've contributed to this country, First Nations, Métis, and Inuit. And so we can be treated and be respected for who we are. And um, I do this for my parents because they were, they were so adamant about us uh, presenting ourselves and um, contributing uh, to this country. And um, with that, I don't know if uh, 
if you want to find out about our, about our spirituality, uh, we would uh, visit uh, Lake St. Anne every year. My dad had this pickup truck and he put willows over the back with a tarp over top and in went all the children, our, our trapper's tent, our grub box, our clothing, and where we would go to Lake St. Anne. So where I'm coming with this, um, I've, I try to uh, challenge myself every year. And uh, the one year I, um, I said, I'm going to Lake St. Anne to uh, be a Eucharistic minister and give our people communion. Um, and it's been such a joy. But um, of course, during COVID, we couldn't go. And um, at the Pope's visit, um, I went to Lake St. Anne and through our Alberta Teachers Association Elders Advisory, uh, Christina Fox, I was so proud. <laughs> Christina Fox uh, did the rosary in Blackfoot and Gouda Gamray and her sister did the throat singing. And at the end of the visit, I was involved with uh, the spirituality of uh, the Métis people through with Craig Jinn at the University of Calgary. And he wrote a song called Walk With Me. And I contributed pictures of my family and how we went to Lake St. Anne every year and a picture of my dad walking in the, in the waters of Lake St. Anne. And uh, I was, my heart was full because they played the video. That was the last thing they played at the Pope's visit. Uh, it was very uh, overwhelming, <laughs> but you can look it up. It's called Walk With Me, uh, Lake St. Anne 2020. And uh, my name was the last name on the screen at the Pope's visit. I just about fell off my, uh, my bench. <laughs> And it's, uh, uh, I guess I am doing my work because it is getting all over. And I enjoy teaching, teaching and connecting with, um, with anyone and sharing our educating people on who we are. So you're going to hear a lot about us in September when we become uh, uh, self-government and um, Right now, they're looking at all the uh, Métis graduates at the university, and uh, we will be employing our own people. So uh, big things are happening for us, and um, very proud to be Métis right now, and I will continue sharing uh, and educating. And if we can come together with the superintendents and teachers, uh, with First Nations, Métis, and Inuit, Look what they can do for our children. They can all grow up and be proud of who they are. And, uh, and um, that's, that, that's just the biggest thing, is be proud of who you are and, uh, and move forward, maybe together in parallel with, uh, with, uh, with our Canadian government and people. Um, <clears throat> But we can we can walk a parallel path. So that's what I'll that's all I have to offer today, and um, I think that's enough. <laughs> but wherever you want to begin with uh, sharing and walking side by side, I'm in. Thank you so much, Doreen, um, for sharing um, with us today. We appreciate your time, and uh, we value. Um, your words and uh, wisdom. So I do have Mary um, on the phone and I'm just going to put a picture of her up so we can see her while she uh, shares with us um, some of her knowledge on um, relationship and connecting uh, with us as First Nation, Métis or Inuit. And I will, Mary, can you, uh -huh. can you hear Mary everybody? Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, okay. 
All right, so Mary, you are live. I'm going okay. to show a picture of you now. All right, okay. okay. Yeah. Oh, Crystal, you're muted. You were muted when you went to the screen. I, apparently I'm muted. Sorry, okay. unmute. Okay. Unmute. I'm so sorry. Okay, I will try this again. Um, sorry, people. Okay, share. And can you hear us? Yes. And Great. you can see Mary. Okay, sorry, Mary. Okay. All right. Can you hear me now? Can you hear her now? I can't hear them. Yes, we can hear you. Yes. Okay. They okay. can hear us. All right. Okay. Uh, my name is uh, Mary Cardinal Collins, and um, I was, um, I usually like to bounce on um, what was said before, but um, I can't do that today. So I'll kind of. Uh, um, I'll kind of uh, start from scratch, and uh, I don't know what was um, shared before, but I do know that um, I, 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 I uh, listened to the last part of Doreen's um, presentation, and uh, Doreen is one of the um, elders on um, on the. Um, committee at the ATA committee and I think that's where I'll start with um, sharing some of my information on uh, to the CAS people and um, so where do you start when you're looking for um, resource people you're looking for elders um, I would start at uh, asking asking around for um, to uh, maybe the ATA to the friendship centers, chief and council of wherever wherever it is that you um, um, want to sh share the elders' wisdom with. Um, one of the things you have to um, find out is um, is uh, you have to find out what your elder is, um, what what their uh, specialty is. Okay, for instance, um, because I, I know Doreen and I know Guta, um, their specific. Uh, knowledge is on um, Inuit uh, Nunavut, in fact, uh, Eastern, Eastern um, Arctic. And uh, for Doreen, it's uh, Métis, Métis history. She's a darn good jigger. And um, has a, um, uh, we can only tell uh, talk about our experiences, say, mm -hmm. for um, we can only tell our story. So when um, you find out um, with your elders that um, find out what their specialty is. For instance, myself, I can only tell my story. And I'm, um, my specialty is language, uh, Cree language, and languages in general. I keep my, um, my uh, information about other languages too. And um, I'm willing to share that. Find out if your um, elders or your resource people, if they're, um, 
willing to um, say prayers, uh, if they're willing to, um, if they're uh, fluent in their language, in, uh, I think, um, Kutan, uh, you have to excuse me, in maybe in Inuvialuit, and uh, for Doreen, it might be Machif, and a mixture of um, uh, mixture of Cree and um, uh, the Métis uh, French and uh, Soro languages of the uh, Machif. Um, one of the things that you have to um, keep in mind is to um, think of your history of um, the, uh, the main treaty areas in Alberta. And the elders always said, well, we want you to um, know your history. Or if you don't, uh, say if you're the superintendent and you're not sure of the history, then you, um, I think it's within your, um, um, is to uh, dedicate um, a worker maybe to, uh, to, to do this, to be in, um, to, to um, be on the lookout for, um, for uh, the history, the history of where, where it is that you're at, what are the um, indigenous kids in your classroom, and don't, don't rely on them. Uh, you're supposed to be teaching the kids, eight. Eh? So whenever indigenous kids are, a uh, topic comes up, um, I remember um, uh, the kids saying, well, they all look at me. And um, you're, you're the teacher. Um, you have to, um, you, you have to know your background information. Like, where is Treaty 7? Where is um, Treaty 8? And where is Treaty 6 in Alberta? And um, try and match your, your um, language groups to, to, um, to whatever, whatever area you're in. <clears throat> and for the Métis, uh, I think a lot of the Métis um, except the ones in, um, that are in, um, in the settlements and in the Métis, I think it's called the Métis homeland. But I remember when we were doing um, Aboriginal studies, we'd say um, some of the groups were the, uh, the, to the town Métis. The people that um, uh, weren't included in the um, settlements, and um, so, uh, 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 for instance, uh, Doreen is quite a. I think she's uh, quite an expert on uh, on uh, sharing stories about uh, the Métis that were off. Uh, of the settlements. Um, I wanted to um, also say um, there's quite a few other languages, other tribal languages, for instance, uh, Stoney, Stoney and Nakoda, Lakota, uh, Sutina, out in um, Treaty 7. And Treaty 8 is mostly Dene and um, Cree and Stony. Stony, those are the Treaty 6 um, and Treaty 8 um, languages that are uh, different from Cree. Um, 
Okay, let's um, what else am I looking at here? Um, one of the things I learned is that, um, uh, for instance, um, throat, throat singing, I think uh, Doreen um, talked about that kind of, uh, and uh, Guta, for instance, uh, this is one thing I learned from her is that uh, the um, Eastern Arctic uh, does throat singing, the Western Arctic doesn't. But I think the, um, I think it's safe to say that there's probably some throat singing um, that are done by some of the Western Arctic uh, people. Um, okay, um, okay, um, was it, were there any questions? <clears throat> um, Mary, we'll, we'll open up some questions after, um, Sokokuto, uh, Randy Bottle is, is going to speak and then Janine okay. Bell is also going to speak and then afterwards we'll open up. Um, to some questions oh so okay. um i appreciate you um accommodating us i'm sorry your technology um didn't work but we appreciate you um your flexibility and sharing with us and yeah. um do you want to stay on the line and uh listen or um i can um i'm just gonna undo the screen Stop share. You're going to take my picture down. <laughs> <laughs> Are you done? I could put it back up. Sorry. <laughs> oh, no, I'm, okay. uh, I'm pretty well done. I usually run out of um, spit and speeches. And um, <laughs> um, <sighs> towards uh, a, a certain, after a certain number of minutes. Yeah, <laughs> I can relate to so. that. <laughs> oh, mm -hmm. All right. So, um, any, any, um, okay. One, one, one more thing. Um, find out if you're elder or um, find out, like I said, what's their specialty. Mine are. Um, uh, I can do presentations on uh, language. I can also do um, presentations on uh, English, English as a second language, and how um, a lot of the um, a lot of the English um, is um, you can you can borrow a lot um, from. Um, English to Cree. Um, a lot of the uh, police names in Alberta, for instance, are um, either Cree um, translations or are there um, French um, translations like Lac La Biche is um, elk. Elk, uh, Elk River, uh, or Lake, Lake of Elk Lake, I guess. So some of them are like uh, translations from the French and um, French to English. A lot of borrowed uh, place names. Uh, a lot of uh, like Athabasca, Wabasca. Those are all Cree words, eh? And I'm pretty sure it's the same in um, in uh, Blackfoot country. Like I had read that Panoka, for instance, was uh, was um, a Blackfoot word. So with um, my Blackfoot brothers and sisters, um, I always. Um, I don't know if you're aware, but um, 
Lockfoot is is uh, very close to Creek in terms of uh, sounds, the sound system, and uh, we have some words that are quite uh, that are the same, but they have different meanings. And um, language is uh, very very interesting to me, anyway. And uh, also to uh, people that are uh, interested in languages, say, eh? and English and all the borrowed words we get from uh, from English names. So with that, I'll um, I'll finish it off. Nanaska, <laughs> oh. <laughs> thank you, Mary. Uh -huh. Hi, 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 uh -huh. hi. All right. Um, so, oh, I've got to stop sharing my screen. And uh, I, I believe we may, uh, we want to value all of our uh, elders and uh, knowledge keepers time. So um, I think that we will skip the, or we may bypass the participant um, questions at the end to value and honor Sokokoto and Janine, because I think everyone's here really to listen to um, our invited guests. Um, so uh, with that said, I will pass the uh, talking stick to uh, Sokokoto. Thank you, Sokokoto. <clears throat> okay, it's an excellent simple I greet you all my relatives. Uh, first of all, really <clears throat> appreciate and uh, an honor to be in the circle and uh, and to share um, who we are as people. And I really appreciate the previous comments that were made as to as to how connected we are to the land and how I was taught by my teachers and elders many years ago is the importance of that kinship. We call that kinship with the land. And in Blackfoot, we call Mother Earth Naha. And this is where everything begins. And we have that kinship or that relationship with the beings of the land, all of the animals. Kinship with the beings of the water, beings of the sky. And I used to hear the old ones many years ago when going through ceremonies, they would always acknowledge all of the beings and how we coexisted because we needed one another for survival. Going back to the land is, is, is very important. And that's where all of the, the lessons and our way of life begins. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the beauty of the land is what the ancestors had left behind. You know, we go back for thousands of years and we see images on stones, circles on the land, and effigies that were left behind. And they all would say, the ones in the future are the ones that are going to learn from that. But what I find is, you know, the beauty and the importance of those messages. They were left there for us to learn from them. But at the same time, I guess the lesson is to figure them out. My belief is that when we have that, that kinship and how that has been shared for thousands of years is what we share with our children, grandchildren, going into the schools and also working with educators, which is really important. What we share with them is what they bring back home, back into their communities. I'm going to use this one school as an example. Where that relationship was really important. And first working with the teachers and to share how important it is to establish that relationship with Na'a, Mother Earth. And also to, 
to bring the students out on the uh, for them to truly understand where all people come from. To begin to understand of how you can connect with that inner voice, that inner spirit that you have. An importance of sound, being out on the land, this is where you really focus, where you are and begin to feel the energy of Na'a. I call that the heartbeat of Na'a. And they begin to understand that that relationship is where they can begin to share who they are as individuals, to share their life, and also to come together to write their own stories, to write their own poetry, artwork. And this is coming from within inside these young people. Because I feel that voice is really important. Language is also very important. And I, I heard how, how much we emphasize in sharing that. I always say our language, and I think you can all understand that our language is in the breath. That is how we share who we are as people. And sharing that breath is way as to how we can communicate at a whole different realm. And to really think about the importance of that breath. And how you can take that. And to take those teachings back to their homes, I always, my thinking is, that's what they bring to the conversations at the kitchen table every morning, sharing with parents, grandparents, the community. Because those voices are very important. They are the ones that's going to, that will make that difference in the future. But that relationship is very, very important. When we have our circle, even with the little ones, right from K to 12 universities and other groups, is to establish that relationship. Once you establish that relationship, you establish that level of trust and respect. And this is when we can hear one another, when we establish that safe environment. And that's when the learning begins, is to really listen from your heart too. My responsibility, and it came with the name many years ago, when my father realized, I started walking in the footsteps of my great grandfather. And he said, it's time to carry the name. It was very interesting as to how he said, it's time to carry the name. Because in the future, Sakokuto is going to go to someone else in our family. It could be during my lifetime or after. But the name itself comes with many responsibilities. And to honor my great grandfather, I fulfill those responsibilities, and I'm, and I'm doing that today, is to share and why stories are so important in our way of life. I can speak from my language, the Blackfoot language, it was never a written language. But some of the stories that we share today are probably 10,000 years old or even going beyond that. And how for centuries our way of life was passed down from one generation to the next. This is why we still have our way of life. We still have our ceremonies. And especially the language. I'm a fluent Blackfoot speaker. 
And my grandmother was one of my first teachers. And, and sharing that with me was a way as to how they would share the stories and the importance of the lessons that we learned from the stories. And I realized in later years what my grandmother was doing was instilling those core values or the good things that I needed to know in life to grow up to be a good person. That was our way of preparing our young people. I just think we all have that gift. And we all share that with young people. Every summer I go to a very beautiful place. And this is where my ancestors kept records for thousands of years. They carved images into the stone. Images that they have seen, the experiences that they've had, even the travels. And those are the archives of our people. I always call it my university. This is where I'm able to, to learn about a way of life that existed thousands of years ago. And it always makes that full circle back to ceremony. The importance of our sun dances, our sweat lodges, and other, other very important ceremonies. And how we share that with other nations. This practice has been ongoing for centuries, where we shared ceremonies, we shared a way of life, we shared stories. I had the opportunity to go down to Mexico where I met a Mayan elder. And he shared stories about where people came from the cold, from up north, where our people shared ceremonies, the language. We traveled all over North America as people. There's mention of how in some languages there are similarities. That is true. But we have many languages, even though we speak different languages. We all spoke a common language centuries ago where we communicated through our own sign language. And that language still exists today. And that is the language that we're sharing with the young people. The importance of how, as people come, that come from the land, and how we communicate, and how that relationship building is so important. And that's how we share. So learning all of the lessons and the beauty coming from the arm of the earth, this is what we're carrying forward. And we do it in many different ways. Storytelling is very important. But also to find other means as to how we can communicate with the young people. All young people sitting down in a circle it's the best way to share. But even today, technology also comes into the picture. And how we can use that to begin to share the beauty of our culture, the beauty of the language, is through technology. If that is how they're going to learn, that is okay. Because they're still learning our way of life. Doing graphic novels <clears throat> and to be able to tell the story in my language at the same time it's being translated into English. To begin to realize that in some cases the Blackfoot language is very difficult 
to learn. That's the response I usually get. But if you converse with others on a daily basis, you begin to understand the basics of the language. I was a leader in my community for a number of years. And I knew the importance of education. And we all know that we always have the best interest of our young people and what we need to do to support them. I ensured that we, we established that support system. Sure, there is a lot of negative languages that are being used out there about who we are as people. But at the same time, I feel the importance or the important part of our way of life is to showcase who we are as people, how educated we are, and we're seen everywhere. Showcasing is a way as to how we can bring that into all of the schools. I feel that is the approach that I take and, and how I can share that with others. I really appreciate the, the comments that were made earlier. And it's good to hear that we're all speaking the same language. We're all looking out for the best interest of our people and what can we do to really enhance that any way that we can. But having the, the knowledge that was shared with me many years ago, I am very blessed to have been in those circles to hear the elders and my grandparents. And these are the stories that I share today. Names have come up quite often. And Sakukwetu is my second name. My first name was Pukanika, which means young leader. And that's what I carried forward for a number of years. But when my dad realized that something needed to change to continue with our way of life, he said, it's time to carry the name Sakukwetu. And what Sapukutu means is crystal clear ice. Maybe that's why I like the winter. But I really appreciate the opportunity to share a little bit about who we are as people, why the land is very important, why images that come from the land is a way of sharing the beauty of our culture and the beauty of the language. But ceremony is really important because that's how it was shared with me many years ago. This amatumsima is to smudge. And this is how we begin our circles. Smudging is a way as to how we begin to establish that relationship. Many years ago, one of my teachers used to say, as soon as you think of or call on the ancestors, they're there with us. And that is so true, because that's what, that's what uh, acknowledging the ancestors and also to acknowledge the higher power is through ceremony. And whatever gifts that come from the land, that is our way of life. So thank you for including me in your circle. And I'm very honored to be in your circle. And thank you for allowing me and giving me the opportunity to share a little bit of who we are as people and what I have to share in life. Esa um, Gokuto, you have taught me that um, in Blackfoot, thank you is a feeling and a gesture. So, hi. Hey. Um, and Janine, I'd like to invite you to share and, um, yeah, 
No, gladly. And, you know, I think it's a beautiful um, intercession or, or to interweave what uh, what Sakokoto uh, had mentioned in regards to naming and that, you um, you know, in our in our Inuit customs, we have naming traditions also, and uh, you know, in in our customs, um, uh, we're named after uh, close fam family friends or, or loved ones who have passed on to the spirit world. Uh, it's a uh, it's believed that it's a link between the past and present. Believe that the spirit of that loved one is enmeshed within the spirit of the individual. Um, in that that individual, that child is is destined to take on the qualities and characteristics, the gifts of that loved one, to ensure that you know those gifts are, are continue to contribute to our common good and to um, you know to to support and uphold our community and uphold lift our community. And so uh, Janine Yovunga, um, my name is Janine. I was named after my great grandfather, John Michelin. He was a, a renowned uh, Inuit hunter, trapper, fisher, and guide. Um, his intimate knowledge of the land led many explorers and adventurers through um, Nunatsi Avuta Nunavik in the Quebec uh, Labrador frontier. Um, even to this day, stories of his abilities to navigate the land, uh, water, and ice of our traditional territories in Nunatsi Avuta Nunavik, um, they echo into today. Um, so I'm mixed Inuk and Haluna, and uh, I'm very fortunate to have been raised on the land and the water of the uh, traditional territories of the Innu uh, First Nation and our Inuit, um, it's, it's the relationships that I formed with the land, the experience, knowledge, and skills acquired through those community-centered land-based um, teachings, through led by my family, by my community, and through spirit that, you know, have, have made me who I am today. And so coming back to the gifts of my grandfather, um, in that, you know, I may not be navigating uh, individuals through the, the Quebec Labrador frontier and our Nunatsi uh, wilderness, but uh, I do navigate, um, you know, individuals through settler colonial institutions, especially the education institution. Um, I've been the first in my family to um, to obtain a post a, a sec a, an education beyond the eighth grade. Um, you know, like many of our other uh, indigenous relatives, my my family, my mom and my dad, and my aunts, uncles, cousins, uh, everyone before me, they were day, day school and residential school survivors, and I missed it by a few years. Um, and my mom really pushed, uh, you know, that education so that I could, you know, use those those air those that platform to to share my gifts and to, you know, again navigate others to successfully um, navigate through these wildernesses. And so, um, you know, I'm grateful to be here uh, to share my a little bit about what I've come to know about relationships with you, and to, you know, and a complementary to to what the other elders have shared. You know, how do you how do you how do you follow um, all of that? But one of the things I learned really quickly was um you know that the way that we interpret and define relationships I think it starts with with that and that recognizing that you know the when we hear the word relationship not all of us understand it in the same way um you know I was confronted with that when I was asked to um to work with the curriculum division in the government of Alberta rewriting the kindergarten to grade 12 um curriculum as a member of the First Nations Métis Inuit division um and you know right away that when we were unpacking this concept of well what is a relationship you know it focused it from that from that from that Canadian contemporary Canadian context it focused on people relationships and it, it you know it, it it failed to recognize that you know our relationships you know they they go far beyond um you know those human relationships and and they include the land ice water and our more than human relatives um so I think it's very important that we understand you know that we start by recognizing that sometimes we don't all de define or interpret relationship in the same way um for our Inuit communities, um, you know, the land, the water, the ice, the soil, our, our winged relatives, our uh, finned relatives, our four-legged relatives, you know, all of our more than human relatives, they're our primary, they're our first and our primary source of knowledge. Everything that we know about how we relate to ourselves, to one another, um, you know, to, to everything comes from, from teachings from them. They're, you know, they're our first teachers, our first texts, uh, our first classrooms. And everything that we know has, has been interpreted by our ancestors. Um, you know, based on 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 
observing on witnessing you know what happens on the land and and those are captured through oral tradition um you know our stories about how to relate and, and what we know and how we live amongst one another um you know in that inter interconnected way um is passed on through story through the intergenerational transfer of knowledge um and it's those and, and within those oral traditions and within those stories um you know our, our principles and our practices are embedded um, within those and and those are the oral traditions of all cultures not only indigenous cultures if you look at you know for example we look at the origin story of of uh, of christianity with adam and eve or or um you know with with god creating the day uh the the earth and all of the everything's in the seven days or we look at um you know the the origin story of turtle island and you know and the the, the muskrat get in the dirt and put it on the back of the turtle or we look at the origin stories of our inuit and how you know things were just as they were and we came out of dirt mounds and we grew like little potatoes in the ground and we we got dug out or you know things you know, all of the ways that we relate to ourselves and our others, all of our principles and practices, everything that influences our actions as, as people, it's embedded within those stories and it comes from the land and it's passed on through that intergenerational transfer of knowledge. And so, um, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to go on too long because I know time is limited, um, but, you know, to understand who we are and, and to, to really form, you know, relationships with us, you need to know, you know, what are our principles, what are our practices, what are our values and our beliefs, what are our stories, um, and then and then that helps because our stories and our principles and practices, they influence our actions, they influence how we you know, they like we have to acknowledge that we relate differently. Each community relates differently. Um, you know, we are we're all unique and we're all diverse, and it's based on you know the the vastness and the diversity of of our geography, our climate, um, and and our waters. And and so you know, for for Inuit, we we live by four um, Inuit Maligait, uh, four uh, four natural laws, um, and they're all centered around relationships, working for the common good. Um, um, being respectful of all living things, maintaining harmony and balance, and continually planning for the future. And then, you know, embedded within those four are eight um, Inuit Hawi Mayatungagi principles. Um, and those principles, again, they're all centered around um, um, respecting relationships and caring for people, um, fostering relationships or a good spirit by being open, welcoming, and inclusive. Um, there's so many, and all of those principles, they they, they they determine how we how we how we walk in this world and how we walk with and among others and so I think you know to to understand you know and, and build those relationships we need to know who we are and what our values are and how our values and our beliefs and our principles influence those actions um we need to situate ourselves in relation like how they how we situate ourselves in relation to one another to ourselves to the land and and see how that may may be different and, and come to understand you know how how do we situate and how do we see relationships as being being similar or different and off, more often than not we find that we have more similarities than differences um you know the best way to you know to to build those relationships is you know spending time in community spending time on the land um you know going out with an open heart and an open mind and and being you know willing to learn from to learn with and from our community members with and from our our waters with and from our land with and from you know our, our more than human relatives because they are they're like again we go back they're our first and our primary teachers, um, you know, everything that we know comes right from, you know, what we've observed and what's been passed on again through uh, the intergenerational transfer of those uh, oral traditions and those stories. So come to know our principles and, and practices and understand them um, and then and then model them and see how how you know how you can live by them too and, and bring those principles into your classrooms bring those principles into your homes um, and and into your communities and and live by them you know it's it's all about building relationships right so you know Dwayne Donald one of um you know he's he's been instrumental in 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 talking about colonialism and and in that you know colonialism has fractured our relationships it's created this big divide between our communities um and so you know the the fractured relationship caused by it is denied those relationships so to decolonize and indigenize and reconcile we need to 
to restore and renew um, those relationships and, you know, and establish them, build them, maintain them um, so that we can grow together and we can come together to share our stories authentically and, and genuinely live in the way that treaty meant for, you know, that relationship where we walk together side by side and, and we learn with and from one another and, and we can take you know, the best of both worlds and, 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 you know, and bridge those gaps and just, you know, and, and create this, this beautiful road forward. And so, um, you know, relationships, it, it all, everything is a relationship. Um, you know, uh, learning is a relationship with, with words on paper or, you know, so anyway, it's, it's building relationships and, and again, spending time, uh, authentic time in community again with open heart and open mind, um, so that we can come to know one another, uh, and our stories and share our stories to come to, you know, a shared, a shared, a shared truth and a shared future and, and, and walk that path forward. Yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, Doreen and Mary, Sagogato, Janine, um, Crystal and I, and I'm sure all who have been here today would ex like to express just deep gratitude to you. And um, as we are, just before we close, um, we wanted to just take a moment to mention that the way we honor knowledge matters greatly. And we wanted to highlight a resource that might be of interest to those of you who are participating today. And this is a, one of the resources that is included um, on the Guide to Relationships on the Relationships link. And it, um, Claudine has put it in the chat and it's Indigenous Education Cultural Protocols document. And it was created by the Calgary Board of Education. And I was part of the work in the very early stages. However, it has been years in the making and many, many people have contributed to what this resource has become. So over time, the Indigenous education team sought guidance from elders and knowledge keepers. They shared their own knowledge to create what is now summarized in the document. Superintendents and other senior leaders worked to make sure that the CBE policy, policies and administrative regulations would uphold these cultural protocols. And I learned this morning it's going to be um, updated over the next couple of months. So we highlight it today because it may be a valuable resource for you in your work. And we know that those who are attending may know of other um, uh, guiding documents around cultural protocol, and you're most welcome to share those in the chat. So as we close, we wanted to highlight the ways that we are honoring the knowledge of Doreen, Mary, Sagogoto, and Janine. While this is often done quietly and in private, we wanted to make it a visible part of the learning today in keeping with the spirit of establishing respectful and reciprocal relationships. So Crystal and I have both been taught that it is important to learn the protocol of each elder and knowledge keeper or leader when we're making a request. And you heard our guests speak to that today. We've learned to simply ask, to not assume and to not be afraid. And so as part of our planning for today, we reached out individually to Doreen, Mary, Sagokuto, and Janine and asked if they would share their protocol with us. And each of them did so with great kindness and generosity. We've also learned that it is important to be clear about what we're asking. So we did that also. And We've learned how important it is to honor the knowledge they shared with us, the time that each of them has taken to be here, to prepare to be here. And so we are including an honorarium for each of them today as a way of expressing gratitude for their trust in us and their willingness to share their knowledge today and as part of what will become a resource for CAS. 
And in addition to an honorarium, we have a gift for each of them to show our appreciation. And you will see in that guide that there, there are, um, it, it may really help you to see how you can take some of those steps also in your own work. So Doreen, Mary, Sagokoto, and Janine, Crystal and I would like to put our hands to our heart for, to you for being willing to be here, to trust us to be here, and to share your knowledge with all of us today. We are grateful. And I'd like to, Crystal and I would both like to express thanks to all of you for being interested, for showing up at this time of the day. What a wonderful response we have had to this invitation from across the province, from people in so many different roles serving in education. What a delight to see all of you who are, who are here. So I would like to... Um, Ask Doreen if you would be willing to close us today with a prayer. Merci. Everything is so simple, and we make everything so complicated. That's why we're confused. The Creator designed a very simple set of laws for us to follow. If we follow these simple things, we'll be happy. If we don't follow these simple things, our li lives become complicated. For example, respect Mother Earth, love one another, be truthful, give to your brothers and sisters, be gentle with each other, and be happy. Following these simple laws will have great rewards. Creator, Great spirit, let me lead a simple life. Merci and the twin and none. And with that, thank you. We will come to a close. Mm -hmm.